Okay, so once again, my name is Weston Bustler. I'm a PhD candidate at NC State University studying nutrition. I'm working under the direction of uh, Dr. Slavko Kormaninsky, and we're all part of the Department of Food, Food Bioprocessing and Nutrition Sciences. So our group's name is the Nutrition Implications Team. And we call ourselves that because we look at these crops that everyone's studying, and uh, we focus more on how they directly affect human nutrition. And this becomes really important when you look at things like epidemiology studies that showcase connections between foods and diseases. Uh, it's, not direct, it's not as direct as that would seem. There's all kinds of variability between these crops, no matter, or depending on where they come from, what lines they were. Banana was just a great example with all the different kinds of bananas that there can be. Now, with a few other crops, there's all kinds of different associations that they could have directly to health effects. And what we do is quantify those with cell and human disease models and test them. For the 2017 team, I have from Pfeiffer University, Jeremiah Nance and Kristen Adcock, from Gustavus Adolphus College in Minnesota, Connor Balfany, and from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Nikita Vemulapali and Michaela Bowen. And now I'll turn it over to my interns to tell you all about the projects that we worked on this summer specifically. Hello, so for our first project this summer, we were studying the glucosinolate profile of Brassica laracea and their effects on the bitter taste, pre on bitter taste perception and their effects with glu glucose homeostasis. So to begin with, glucosinolates are chemical compounds that are naturally found in Brassica laracea, they're cruciferous vegetables. And glucosinolates are broken down by an enzyme known as myrosinase into active components known as isothiocyanates. And these compounds have health associations with colorectal cancer, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. And in addition, they have flavor associations with bitterness. So for our first goal of our project, we wanted to predict the bitterness of a few, of a few crops of the Brassica laracea family. We use the database known as BitterX to find out the binding probabilities of these bitter compounds to the taste receptors on our tongue. And from, from the probabilities from BitterX, we were able to create a discrete probability model that allowed us to create bitterness constants. And shown, shown above on the screen, we, the example for glucobracin and I3C, those were the bitter constants we were able to determine. And then we applied the glucosinolate profiles we were able to average from various journals. And from this, we were able to predict the bitterness for these vegetab vegetables to be cabbage, followed by kale, broccoli, cauliflower, and, ooh, sorry, messed up. <laughs> Brussels sprouts, kale, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, and cabbage. And now, Jeremiah will talk about our second goal for our project. Thanks, Nikita. All right, so for our second goal, we looked at the uh, predicted bitterness, and then we also wanted to measure the perceived bitterness looking at a taste panel. So then we had our participants rank our taste trial. Oh, excuse me. They, they ranked our uh, bitterness for our raw vegetables, which had the intact glucosinolates, followed by the ground, which had the broken down products. Interestingly enough, of our results, we found that raw was less bitter than ground, kale was the most bitter of a taste trial, and people did not think the vegetables were bitter, probably due to our quinine standard. With our third goal, we wanted to measure the impact of glucosinolates on the glucose homeostasis. Depicted right here on the right is normal glucose uptake that is, not un that is unimpeded by uh, the presence of a bitter compound. Glucose can freely move into the cell. However, when a bitter compound binds to the uh, T2R receptor, it impedes the ability of glucose to move into the cell, which is very important for individuals who have type 2 diabetes, as they are susceptible to glucose fluctuations and insulin swings, which can be fatal. We expected, based off our predicted data, that the most bitter vegetables would have the highest discrepancies in terms of their uh, uh, glucose content. However, we did find that kale, in particular, had the biggest difference in terms of its digested form, highlighted in green, well, the light green, and uh, the dark green, which is its undigested form. So in conclusion, we came up with a novel bitter model for the concentration of glucosinolates. We found that glucosinolate content alters glucose uptake within our intestinal cells. But the bitterness of glucosinolates does not appear to be exactly what influences glucose homeostasis. In conclusion, well, excuse me, <laughs> um, Michaela and Kristen will now talk about their oat project. Thanks. Um, so this summer, Michaela and I have been studying oats um, and what aspects of their genome granted um, anti-inflammatory capabilities and how that can be helpful in cutaneous wound healing. 
So oats, they contain avenanthamides, beta-glucans, bioactive peptides, and um, fiber, um, which can be very helpful in wound healing through um, cellular migration and also be anti-inflammatory. In inflammation is seen in many chronic diseases, such as arthritis, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and inflammatory bowel disease. In order to study how um, cell migration and how oats impact cellular migration and inflammation, um, we have been taking a biological approach by using cell models. For our, for our inflammation assay, we used immune cells, which we treated with an oat extract, and then stimulated with a compound called LPS, which is derived from bacteria cell walls. The LPS and immune cells, their reaction created an inflammatory response, which then produced nitrite. We then, we then measure the amount of nitrite produced in order to also measure the inflammation. Next was our cell migration assay. For this, we simulated a wound by planting cells around a stopper. This created an exclusion zone where there were no cells. We then measured cells for about 24 hours um, using fluorescence to see how they would move into the exclusion zone. Overall, we found that um, oats are not all created equal are not all created equal. For inflammation, we found that when compared to controls, about 65% of oats um, had anti-inflammatory capabilities. Or, well, pardon me, they had more positive results, which based upon a cell model uh, was linked to anti-inflammatory anti capabilities. And this is um, shown in the green bars. The more negative results or pro-inflammatory capabilities are shown in red bars. For migration, there is about a 50-50 split um, between oat cell lines that created um, increased migration, which is shown in the purple bars, and decreased migration when compared to controls in the yellow bars. After we um, analyzed the phenotypic effects of oats on cells, we decided to also analyze the oats genome. With the data that we received from the 244 oat lines that we tested, we were able to run a genome-wide association study to see what regions on the oat genome could be potentially responsible for these anti-inflammatory and increased migration speed. So the red dots on this diagram represent areas that were significantly associated with inflammation change, and the blue dots were areas that were significantly associated with migration change. And the areas we have boxed here are particularly interesting because in multiple analyses where oats were grown in multiple locations, these areas were significantly associated with these positive phenotypic effects. So Connor's going to, oh, in conclusion, um, we were able to screen 244 oat samples and their effects on migration speed and inflammation, and the oats showcased a wide range of bioactivity, and our GWAS associated six relevant loci for modifying inflammation and four relevant loci for modifying migration speed, which in these relevant loci, we can now further look into these areas and identify potential candidate genes to be responsible for these bioactive components. Now Connor's going to tell you about his project this summer. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. My name is Connor, and I'm going to tell you about the project I was working on, which is the protein isolation and quality assessment of a plant called Atroplex. Now, this was a project that was new to this year and revolved around designing a protocol that had a high protein yield, produced a food-grade protein, and would be commercially scalable. Now, before I start that, I want to talk about the questions that prompted the search for these answers. Global malnutrition is an epidemic that affects 780 million people worldwide and often occurs in areas where resources are either too scarce or too costly to grow nutritious food sources. Now, the main cause of malnutrition is protein deficiency, and while that may make you think of meat and dairy products, 80% of the world's protein actually comes from plant-based resources. Therefore, the answer to fighting this is a low resource cost plant that also has high nutritional value. Now, enter Atroplex. This plant has a very high protein content, grows very fast, and is a halophyte, which means it doesn't only thrive in high salinity conditions, but it also grows very fast in them as well, often yielding two cuttings per year. In addition, the leaves, stalks, stems, and seeds are all edible for nutritional yield. So with all of this information, we entered into the research component, and this involved in the extraction of protein. 
We started with a plot being cultivated in Idaho, and we got the leaves shipped to us as fresh leaves and freeze-dried tissue samples. These were then blended with uh, sodium hydroxide and then filtered off in a Buchner filtration which removed the lysed cell membrane. What was left was a green liquid called an LPC or a leaf protein concentrate which was then acidified and heated to coagulate the protein. When this was centrifuged, it yielded a pellet which could then be freeze dried and would be a protein extraction. Now the first protein extracted is a green protein and as the name applies, it is green because it is bound to the chlorophyll and other impurities within the LPC. While this has a much higher protein or a much higher yield, it has a less of a protein content because of the protein, because of the binding of the chlorophyll. However, if you continue by decanting the supernatant, acidifying and heating that, you get a beige protein, which has less of a yield, but is a much higher protein concentration. We then started our tests on these extracts and ran a BCA, which stands for bichronic acid assay. This basically quantifies how much protein is present in the sample, and we compared these to other commercial standards, such as whey proteins and pea extracts that are plant-based protein derivatives. So the top two lines, those are the whey proteins, and this is what uh, muscle builders are using and are very, very commercially available. However, right below those, those are the beige protein extracts that we received in lab, and as you can see, they have a very high protein concentration, especially when compared to the pea extracts and the pea flowers. Now, not only does Atroplex have a very high protein concentration, it also has a very nutritious protein concentration, and this is measured by a PDCAS, which stands for Protein Digestibility Complete Amino Acid Score. What this basically does is it looks at the amino acid composition of a protein and says how easy it is for our body to digest and how nutritious it is. So this really looks at the essential amino acids, which are only derived from the foods we intake, and even though Atroplex has a 35% protein content compared to the purest P extract and the Vitessence P flour, Flour. Because it has more essential amino acids, the PDCAS score is actually higher, being a more nutritious protein. So these results are really, really very, very cool. But what's even cooler is the future direction that is still left. We didn't have time to start a cell assay, and this would involve creating a line of muscle cells, C2, C12 cells to be exact, and then we would test these protein isolates to get a biological response and see what the effects are on that. We would also compare it with the whey proteins and the pea proteins as well. In addition, we want to test other atroplex species to see if they have these same results, and all in all, all of these results will very well aid in our fight against global malnutrition. So thank you very much for your time, and I'll hand it back to Wes to give acknowledgments and a conclusion. Thank you, Connor. And uh, I wanted to acknowledge the entirety of the P2EP program. So that's uh, General Mills, Dole, my fellow graduate mentors, as well as NCSU and UNC Charlotte. General Mills also for the Crop Bioscience Division and all the help they've given us on OATS and Atriplex. Uh, the UNC Charlotte Bioinformatics Services Division, Rob Reed and all the help that he's had in uh, the bioinformatic portions, as well as the uh, Kormaninsky and Esposito Labs and all the help that we have used for the uh, cell assays the entire summer. It's been a chaos all over with this many projects. It's been absolutely intense, but we've been able to do it. And just overall, this has been five years for me of intern madness. I've had 30 interns, and this every year has been different with all kinds of new projects and challenges, and we've produced some really cool results over this time. So with that, I'll conclude and take any questions that you guys may have. Thank you.